Hello everyone. Welcome to a DNS tutorial session. In the past, I've talked about many other topics. But today, we will look at a very foundation level topic, DNS, Domain Name System. Looking at the jargon, don't assume that this is only for networking professionals. Are you an internet user? If yes, then you should also probably spend a few more minutes watching this video till the end. I can guarantee you that you will learn something useful and new today. See, if you don't understand the very basics of something, you will never be able to relate the complex concepts. This is true in every aspect of your life. Consider an example when you build a house. Well, everyone is not a civil engineer to do so, but let's say you ask an engineer to build a house for you. Where does he start or what does he pay the most attention to? The foundation, of course, because if that goes wrong, everything else will eventually fail. DNS is a foundation level concept and that's why I'm so excited to talk to you about it. Let's begin. There are so many other sources out there that talk about DNS. Some say it all and some say what is required. We over here will talk about what you need to know when someone asks you, hey, can you explain how DNS works for me? Or has it made you wonder on what really happens when you type in a name of a website on a web browser? So what is DNS? It stands for Domain Name System and not Domain Name Server or something else. It makes the internet usage easy for us. It provides a naming structure for all the resources on the internet. These resources could be servers, devices, etc. Without the DNS being available, websites would be accessible only by entering a long string of numbers, which obviously is not feasible. Let's talk about a bit of DNS history. Not much, but a little bit of history because I don't want to bore you right at the beginning even before we start with some fun facts. DNS actually dates back to more than 30 years. Before DNS came into existence, we used to use text files to store name to IP address mapping. Do you know we still have this text file lying around somewhere in your computer? Don't know what an IP address is? Check out the IP address video on my Facebook page or my YouTube channel. If you're using Windows, try this out. Go to the C drive or the drive which has your Windows installed and navigate to Windows, System32, Drivers, ETC and Hosts. Open it up using a notepad or any other text editor. See? We still have a part of history lurking around. Let's come back to the present. The naming of a resource is what DNS is all about. IP addresses are hard to remember. So how is this naming done? It's very straightforward. The name starts from right to left and in a hierarchical order. So let's take an example. Google.com No, that's wrong. No, this is not the real name of google.com. It's google.com dot. That's right. That's google.com with a dot at the end. Not many of us know this, right? If you want to be grammatically correct, the dot is silent. Technically, it is assumed to be there at the end of every name, but you are not forced to write it. Go try it. Type google.com dot in your web browser, any web browser, it still will work. So here we have covered the root domain, which is the dot we talked about right now. And it is the same for all names. Then after this is the top level domain, for example, .com. Then a subdomain and eventually the host or the resource name. In our example, there is no subdomain but there could be one or more of them. Now let's try to pictureize the whole concept of name to IP mapping and how this happens in the background. 
you type in facebook.com dot in your web browser and it all begins. The first place the web browser checks is its own browser cache. Anything that it remembers from previous searches. In our example, we are trying facebook.com for the first time. So any old information is not present for this website. Next, the browser looks for the name to IP mapping in the operating system's DNS cache. It won't find it there as well because this is the first time. But why are all these checks done in the cache? It's because this will save network resources and your system does not need to go to the network to get this information again and again. So what if stale information is present in my cache? This is managed by a cache cleanup or update timer which is usually very short for browser caches and is approximately one day for system cache. So let's get back to the name lookup process. We have exhausted our cache lookups and we need to get to the network for this. The first place that our system now looks is the configured DNS server. If you check your network settings, this is usually set to automatic or a manually configured DNS server. If it was set to an IP, it was manually set. If not, the DHCP server provided that information. There is another DHCP walkthrough that is in the making where I will explain how this information reaches the PC. For now, it just does. The DNS server that is configured can be a local intranet DNS server which is managed by your ISP or your internal IT team if you're working in an enterprise network. It can also be an internet DNS server like the one most of us use that is hosted by Google 8.8.8.8. If these DNS servers do not have the information that you are looking for, the final resort is to go to the root servers. The servers are no magic servers. They just manage entries for top level domains, also called as TLDs. You might remember this from earlier. Examples of TLDs or top level domains are .com, .org, .net and so on. From here, a trickle down approach or a hierarchical approach is taken to find the final domain to IP mapping. In our example, it is facebook.com, so we look for who has .com and eventually try to find out facebook.com. If it is a longer name like x.y.x.com, then it will eventually take longer and more queries to finally find out the IP for that. This is the happier version of the story of course, whereas if anywhere in the middle there is a timeout or no information is present, the web page will never load. Modern web browsers usually tell you clearly that this is a DNS issue and if in case the query failed. A good to know point here is that there is something called reverse DNS as well, in which case you provide an IP address and look for a name. You can try this on your Windows machine. Go type cmd in your search or run. Once the command prompt is open, usually a black window, type nslookup space google.com. You will get one or more responses. This was a simple forward DNS query. Let's do the reverse now. Copy that IP address that you received. Type NS lookup and paste the IP address that you just copied. Run the command. You will get a response, but a different one. Don't worry, you will see something weird here. The reverse query usually returns a somewhat weird long name, which may or may not make sense because our expectation was to get google.com out of this reverse query. However, why this happened was that when you reverse look up the IP, 
you get the exact server name that is serving queries for google.com usually region wise and not exactly google.com I hope you are not thinking that this one server was handling all google.com queries. If you were, then you're wrong. As if that would have been the case, the server would crash within a second with the amount of people or devices actually trying to reach that website. Before we wrap up, there are some terms that I feel you should know as well. For example, recursive and non-recursive DNS queries. The DNS client or the requester can make a request for a recursive query in which it sets the recursion desired flag and asks the DNS server to search for the name or IP on its behalf and get back to it when done. Because believe me, as we saw earlier, it can take multiple queries to find the mapping. The DNS server may or may not honor this request. In the case it does not honor it or if the request was never made as recursive, the client itself will do the job of making the queries. The servers that are involved in the whole process will simply give information about who can help the client better and reach the intended destination. Another set of terms are authoritative or non-authoritative responses. Authoritative responses are responses that come directly from a name server or a DNS server that has authority over the record in question. Non-authoritative answers come second-hand or more that is from another server or through a cache. Lastly, you should also understand what zone transfer means. Zones are basically containers which contain record information or name to IP mapping or the opposite. Zone transfers are the means by which a slave or a child DNS server pulls records from master or a parent server for backup and redundancy purposes. Kind of a failover. They take place over TCP because the data being transferred is usually substantial and most likely over 512 bytes. Dig for Linux and NSLOOKUP for Windows are simple tools that can be used to make DNS queries. So there you go, you have it all figured out and you can go share it with someone. If you feel they will benefit from this video, go ahead and share it. At Network Lobby, Information is neither created nor destroyed. It is shared for the benefit of the community. Like the video if you really like it. Post a comment if you have any feedback. Share the video because someone out there is still looking for this. Follow the page for more interesting and good to know things about networking. See you all again soon in another interesting video. Happy learning.